Okay, well, welcome everyone to the July edition of the Coffee Microcaps Microcap Fund Manager interview. I'm delighted to say we're joined by uh, Carlos Gill from Micro Equities. Carlos, how are you? Mark, I'm great. Delighted to be here as well. And uh, for anybody who attended one of our in-person conferences when those were a thing in, uh, in Sydney, you would have seen Carlos in one of our panel discussions back then. Uh, and today we're going to chat about um, two interesting stocks and uh, about a new fund that uh, you guys are launching. But I think for, for anybody who might be familiar with micro equities, maybe just give us a kind of a, a broad overview of the business, because I know there's probably five or six funds in there at the present time. Yeah, sure. So, so micro equities was founded in 2005. And we went into funds management just over 12 years ago with our flagship deep value fund, which has been running now for over oh, close to 12 years. That's that's returned some some really high returns for our investors, uh, an average of 19.2% of compound return net of all fees since inception. And, and that's still today our marquee fund. Uh, we manage um, north of $450 million, which in itself doesn't really mean much, whether it's 300 or 600, it's neither here nor there. But I think the most important part of that number is that the biggest client cohort that we have is ourselves. We, we have over $60 million of our own money co-invested alongside our clients. And that's not just old money, Mark, that's grown over time. That's that's new, fresh money that we put at risk alongside our clients. And we do that and we regularly top up our, our funds. So we'll continue to be um, the single biggest uh, cohort of clients um, over the long term because we very much believe in what we do. Okay, great. And you talk about the deep value fund. That was the, the one that, that started the whole story. Can you just give us a quick overview of the of the new fund that you're launching now? It's quite a quite an exciting space, I think. Yeah, we've been wanting to invest in in, in private equity for a long time, but we, we we you know the planets had to align in, in terms of recruiting the right talent. And and that's actually happened earlier this year where we've been able to bring some really, really good people into, into, into the investment management team. So we're going to be launching a private to beyond the IPO fund. Um, that fund is in capital raise right now. Um, we expect the fund uh, to close uh, towards the end of this month. Um, we're seeking to raise $50 million from wholesale investors with a minimum investment of $100,000 per investment. Okay, great. And if anybody wants to grab a copy of the PDS, uh, who's the best person at MicroEquities, I guess, to reach out to? Look, best way to get that is go to microequities.com.au and request an info pack. Uh, there's an apply online, um, but, but any of our relationship managers will, will contact you once you fill in your details there. Okay, great. And then I guess uh, the two stocks you've picked, one of them I think will probably be a candidate in this uh, in this new fund, um, Complexia. So I think maybe let, if we just talk through uh, through that business, I, I, I think give a sense of you know some of the companies that are going to end up in this new fund. So if we look at Complexia, I mean, how do these guys make their money? Yeah, so so Complexia is a deal. It, it's it's kind of a flagship deal that we've done for the fund. It's completely um, proprietary in nature. It, it, it wasn't, we were competing with other fund managers or other family offices to try and invest. It was, it, it was an exclusive deal brought to us through a very long established relationship with the founder and the company itself. Um, we've, we've actually uh, gonna be cutting a check for $5 million into that business. So it will form a, a cornerstone and core investment of the fund. Um, what Complexica does is it's in, it produces and develops uh, artificial intelligence software. Um, and that's kind of like a big term that's been around and sort of thrown around a lot. But, but, but essentially, if you think about the, the digital revolution, which has been going on for 70, 80 years, what the digital revolution is, is, is really um, um, automating um, manual processes that might have been done on, on pen and paper with the benefits of a central processing unit and, and quite simple algorithms. And kind of, you know, the, the digitization of, of society and enterprises is a 70 to 80 year old um, revolution that, that we're going through. And there's probably 
another 10 or 20 years till, till that kind of comes to an end and in every single enterprise, every touch point that, that you can think of in our society uh, will have been completely transformed into a, into a digital um, uh, space. Artificial intelligence is kind of the, 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 the second revolution within that first revolution where you have very complex algorithms that are observing and, and observing and, and analyzing data, real-time data as it comes in and then um, adjusting the algorithms to, to optimize the end, uh, the end outcome that, that is being seeked by the enterprise or the organization. And that in itself is not new. The artificial intelligence has been going on for 20 or 30 years. What's really interesting is that it's really starting to, to, to break through the hearts and minds of key decision makers in, in enterprises to, to a level that they acknowledge that they must transform um, their digital assets into, into really smart assets through the benefits of artificial intelligence. And so Complexica plays in this space. Um, it's a business that started literally from ground zero um, five years ago, but it has been growing really, really fast. In fact, the last four years, it's been growing uh, its revenue organically at an average growth rate above 50%. So, you know, if you think about most of the assets that we own in the publicly listed space, a good organic growth rate is considered anywhere between 10 to maybe 25% at the high end. Um, Complexica is growing organically at 50% plus. So it sort of gives you a, a, an idea of how quickly um, it, it's growing its revenues and how big it's going to become in a, in a short period of time. So Complexica provides these artificial um, these artificial intelligence software solutions for enterprises uh, historically that have seek to optimize either their sales or their promotional activities. So it started very much its early life in the fast moving consumer goods sector, but it has branched out into other uh, industry verticals such as the pharmaceutical sector and supply chain logistics. And we were very excited about this investment because the quality of the business model is one that we have a lot of deep experience in. We've, we've successfully invested in, in artificial, in, in software enterprise before in our publicly listed in, in investments. Um, and we know SaaS business models to be a very high quality uh, uh, nature with repeatable, um, with a repeatable revenue stream that's highly visible, almost annuity like in nature. Um, so we, we, we're excited about this investment. We're also highly impressed that, that a business that literally started five years ago has been able to secure some of the top tier clients that they have. And we're talking about some, you know, very large organizations like Johnson & Johnson, the Arnott's Group, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners know, which is today owned by KKR. Um, just, just some great names and some great logos in terms of their client base. So um, it, it's, it's already achieved um, something quite inconceivable from its ground zero start. But we're super excited about the journey ahead of us because we really do believe that artificial intelligence is going to be a societal thematic for many decades to come. And hence the, the, the growth runway is a very deep one. And in terms of, I guess, the, is the thesis then from your side that it, it's just further penetration of that of that enterprise um, space? Uh, it does it, uh, maybe if I backtrack it quickly, is it Australia only at the minute, or did, do they have like international clients as well? They, they do have some international clients. I, I mentioned uh, Johnson and Johnson in the pharmaceutical sector. We think international expansion, further international expansion, will be logical. Our excitement about this business is when when eventually Complexica IPOs and goes to market, it'd probably be a 20 million plus revenue business. But we can quickly see that this business becoming 100 million plus in revenue. And I think once Complexica achieves that, uh, because of, of the singularity around um, how very few artificial intelligence software businesses list on the ASX and the high quality business model, this is potentially a billion dollar plus um, enterprise in the main. And, and that's really the journey that we we um, envisage, and that's why we're we're very excited about joining them on that journey. Okay, great. Uh, sounds like um yeah, digital revolution kind of two point the kind of next iteration. First, there was digitization from you know 
pen to paper now it's actually okay we've digitized everything how can we i guess get everything to work smarter for us in, in, but more specifically for complexity and that kind of sales and marketing um division if i if i can say that and uh, my wife works in digital advertising and digital marketing so i can tell you that it's all about data these days indeed and, and the interesting thing is this is algorithms that are self-learning on on the data that they that that they're collecting on on the enterprise and then uh, seeking to optimize themselves and changing the, the the algorithm variables to 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 continually optimize and adjust for for better continual improvements great and it's a fully i'm guessing a fully enterprise b2b there's no kind of retail offering you you, you know some of our listeners won't kind of come across them marketing to them i guess no, it's 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 purely it's 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 a hundred percent B two B enterprise, and and you know our experience um, investing in software technology tells us that B two B models tend to be a lot less riskier because in the business to consumer side, it's a lot easier to, for the customer to churn, whereas in in business to business, um, usually the the software. Uh, immerses itself a lot deeper and ingrains itself a lot deeper in the in in the business, and therefore the pain the pain point of changing or churning is a lot greater. The pain threshold is a lot higher, and therefore it results in much longer uh, client engagement, and therefore less churn, less risk. Yeah. Okay. Great. That sounds uh, sounds like it's going to be one of I think of a, a, an interesting uh, number of new stocks in the new fund, um, but one I think uh, if we if we go a bit old school back to the back to the listed environment, uh, I, I mentioned off air before we came on uh, the stock you've selected is uh, I select group and um, yeah this is a, a, I said a phoenix from the ashes but I, I don't know if you can use that one it's about its third or fourth. <laughs> rising uh, at this point since it listed in 2013 but for for anybody who's who maybe not familiar with the the i select business maybe just give a quick overview of uh, you know how these guys make their money yeah so so look uh, i select is a digital marketing um organization it it helps to uh, create a pseudo online marketplace of different alternate product and service providers so the consumer can compare the market. It, it doesn't necessarily compare the entire market, but it, it compares a substantial part of, of the market in specific industry verticals like um, healthcare, life insurance, telecommunications, gas, and other forms of insurance products. So instead of you going one by one to the, to, to the uh, product issuer, you can go to a place like iSelect and, and get a very strong or, or quite a broad vantage point of all the product offerings, all the different product specs and the pricing around each product. So it, it, it's an efficient usage of the consumer's time and, and gives the consumer uh, quite, a, quite a broad uh, viewpoint of, of, of the product marketplace. And... I guess what's the, the the investment thesis for you guys in I Select? I mean, it's been around since 2013. I, it's got a, a new-ish CEO, which is I think maybe their third CEO since since listing, or maybe the fourth. Um, you know, I guess what what's changed to 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 to, to make it uh, interesting for you guys at this point? Yeah, sure. Look, I I, I think right, it'd be probably a little bit unfair to call it a phoenix because because it hasn't hasn't gone through a knee life it hasn't died and it hasn't really gone through a knee life <laughs> death experience it certainly had been on a significant downward spiral um so i'd call it much more i'd categorize it much more of a a turnaround um scenario than than a phoenix where it was literally on life support or or, or a walking zombie so so look our, our 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 excitement about this this investment opportunity mark is is twofold. Um, you know, this is a market where, you know, particularly at, in, in, in various segments, its value is incredibly scarce to find. Like it, you know, a lot of the companies that we look at um, might be interesting, but for, from, a, from a valuation perspective, they're well north of what we consider to be fair value. If you look at iSelect, it's got a market capitalization of, of circa $90 million currently. 
But if you actually look at and analyze the balance sheet, there's a trail commission book, which is which is being discounted to present value. So that, that's a, a tangible asset that resides in that in that balance sheet, which is worth roughly $95 million, sorry, $120 million. And in terms of the net tangible assets of the company, um, its net tangible assets are north of the market value today. So you're essentially buying hard tangible assets and you're not actually paying anything for the ongoing business. So right there, you kind of get a, a huge um, free kick from a, from a value perspective. So, so that's the first thing, the valuation um, um, looks really, really interesting. Uh, but that in itself isn't enough, right? We don't buy an asset merely because it's undervalued. Um, and we're not interested in owning an asset that's not going to grow over time. And that's really the interesting point. I think we, we're, we are, are either at or very close to, to an inflection point in terms of the profit evolution of this group. And, and we saw Isilex first half earnings, if you really analyze the first half earnings on an underlying basis, already provide a solid um, bottom line number of, of circa $10 million in EBITDA, stripping out you know, all the job keeper and, 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 and all, all the non-repeat. And, and, and we think the company is well poised for, for growth into FY22. Um, we think you know, you know, your, your reaction to, to iSelect is kind of um, um, quite, quite relevant because I think most of our peers in the small cap and institutional space have really put it at custard aside and not really had a fresh look at it for, for maybe two or three years. And that explains why the current share price is so depressed. And, and we think probably over the next 12 or 18 months, as we expect to see iSelect's profits start to rebound and grow into FY22, um, you know, quickly some of our colleagues are going to come to the view that, oh, geez, this, this looks incredibly cheap in an otherwise highly expensive market. Why is it so cheap? And some of them, I think, will turn around and say that it actually shouldn't be this cheap and they'll end up buying it. So, so you know, we think it's at an inflection point in terms of its earnings. Um, uh, I think about a month ago, they made an announcement that they've signed Bupa to their healthcare panel. Uh, that's a really important development because Bupa was a was a key player that was missing in terms of their healthcare business, and and healthcare accounts for sixty five percent of their revenue. So today, it's still the core business, and you probably know that Bupa um, represents about twenty four or twenty five percent of the Australian um, uh, health insurance market. So it's it's a huge player, and it's an absolute coup. And we think that'll be one of the reasons why FY twenty two uh, I select is going to grow. And uh, well, you know, hope springs eternal. So maybe some of the other, the other uh, Insta guys up and down Macquarie Street there will cha change their mind. But um, you know, from their point of view, what have been some of the risks that um, you know they're probably looking out for? I I know Bupa have come on. I know from the past, and I select. You know, they they've lost some of these big kind of panel members, and it's like really affected. Um, you know, the, the kind of traction that the business gets, you know, uh, I guess the things that keep you up at night about it? Look, cash flow conversion has always been an endemic issue for the, for the business. And, and that's always been something that the market hasn't liked. If you look at the uh, operational cash flow versus the underlying EBITDA earnings, they're always at a mismatch. Um, and that's because they build up this this tangible asset called um, the the um, the uh, the book, and so that that builds up over time. So I'm sure that's you know always a liability, but that's just the nature of, of the model. There's a there's a trail book that the business generates. It doesn't collect all its its revenue up front, and and so that working capital is always an element. Um, so there's always a, a small level of risk associated with the working capital movements on a year by year basis. You've mentioned a, another risk, a key supply risk from, from key vendors like Booba. If they come in and out of the panel, that, that can have an important element in uh, an important change to, to, the, to the company's fortunes. And there's also um, competitive, um, competitive risk. You know, iSelect isn't the only marketplace or market comparison player. Um, you know, they've got 
at least two other significant players in there uh, in the market that that are also doing something similar. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't play in a competitive vacuum. Mm. All those things together, though, um, should still give you a, a valuation well north of, of its current share price. We just we look at this and we just scratch our heads and and, and we think that this valuation cannot that this market cap capitalization um, just doesn't justify the risk reward. Okay. And speaking of competitors, I see it's one of its main competitors is a strategic shareholder and recently increased its shareholding. Uh, was it from 28 to 34 or so something like that? And they added another six on there. Yeah, they've, they've been there for, for some time and, and uh, it's a little bit um, difficult to understand exactly what their long-term plan is for their business. Uh, there was uh, previously, quite some time ago, a failed uh, takeover uh, approach uh, for iSelect. Um, I'm not sure they'll ever do that again or what they intend to do with, with their current holdings. Um, it's not central to, to our investment thesis. Um, you know, we're, we're buying iSelect not on the back of, of, um, of, it, of the business being involved in, a, in an M&A type play, but, but just because we think um, it's, a, it's an asset-backed business um, with a quality trail book. I mean, six, it's close to 70% of the trail book is, is, is from, from the private health insurance uh, supplies, and, and that's a reliable counterparty from a, from a risk perspective. Um, so, so we're not, we're not feeling uncomfortable about the quality of the trail book. Um, and importantly, we think, you know, iSelect is going to grow in FY22 and, and for a growth business that's going to deliver, you know, anywhere between maybe 18 to $20 million in operating profit. Um, and, and, and you have a, a market capitalization that's below the NTA, that's a pretty compelling investment opportunity. I agree. Carlos, we'll, we'll have to leave it there. Um, if anybody wants to find out uh, more about, let's say, some of the more longer established folks, the deep value one, the income one, the pure value, uh, microequities.com.au, is that the, the best place to go? That's the best place to go. Okay, great. We'll leave it there. Carlos Gilf, microequities, thank you very much for, for joining us this month. Thank you for having me, Mark.